think the, the rationale for having a panel on international programs and initiatives to complement what has largely been a domestic uh, US focused conversation um, is to really understand what is relevant that's going on around the world in different countries and among countries um, that would be important to include in our thinking um, in relation to the workshop charge. Um, I think it's also nice that this international session is coming right after the local session because it gets us to think a little bit about a cross-cutting theme uh, that has um, been with us since um, the, our introductions, um, which is scale and scaling, um, and how to think about um, uh, the kinds of principles, the concepts, the um, ideas that um, are maybe working at one scale and not another or could be scaled up. Uh, so, you know, for example, um, uh, Missy started off her introduction by talking about how much she loves the local scale. Uh, John Norgren um, uh, mentioned both the kind of promise and the peril of taking one sector in one region at a time. Uh, and I think that we've all um, been kind of attuned to the scalar dynamics um, in each of these sessions, um, but at least from my perspective, it's still a little bit murky how we incorporate uh, this thinking um, better into what we're working towards um, throughout the meeting. So I wanna have our three panelists come up, uh, Maria, uh, Jim, uh, and Mark, um, and, oh great. Um, and uh, you're gonna be doing timing, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and they're each gonna have about 10 uh, to 12 minutes to talk about different uh, aspects of the international landscape. Now, of course, we're not gonna uh, tour the entire world here today or cover everything that is going on, um, but some of the kind of key organizing questions that um, you know, I, I, I thought to introduce to this are, uh, first of all, are there any key elements, practices, qualities, or concepts of the science policy interface that are found at the international level and the kinds of programs and initiatives that we can speak to here today that have been left out of our discussion so far. So what's missing that we might learn from the international level? Uh, and then second of all, um, what is missing at the international level of the science policy interface that can provide the kind of top-down leadership resources uh, inspiration that really can permeate down to national and regional levels. Um, so hopefully we'll get to some of those ideas um, through the remarks um, that these three esteemed panelists have to offer. And for that, we'll start with Mark. Uh, thank, thanks, James. Um, I think it's a hard call coming after the previous panel because they're just so, so good. So I'm not sure that I can quite uh, meet all of your requirements there, there James, but I'll, I'll give it a go. So what I'm going to talk about um, today is uh, largely about the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, I've, I've been involved in that since 1991 um, in a whole raft of roles. At the moment I'm a Vice Chair of Working Group 2, um, so I'm on what's called the IPCC Bureau. Um, and, I, and I'm talking about this because I, I think it's actually uh, a, a classic example of a science policy interface. It was established initially explicitly for that intent to be at the UN level um, a way of uh, getting science into the policy discussion at a governmental level. So it is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The governments own that panel. The scientists don't own that panel. And it's one of the largest and possibly long, most long-running in terms of climate change um, science policy interfaces. So um, in any given assessment process, there'd be several thousand uh, scientists involved in that process, um, uh, somewhat equivalent number of uh, policy makers across the world and it probably produces the most reviewed documents in the history of humankind. And so um, it's actually a, a, a non-significant example, I think, of, of science policy. Now, the, the story I'm going to tell, I think, is, is one of um, the need for evolution of institutions. Um, and so what is a, an appropriate um, institutional arrangement and appropriate mix of science, as the issue progresses, no longer is so. And, and it, if you don't evolve in those circumstances, you become increasingly irrelevant, and that's the challenge, I think, which faces the IPCC and other institutions. So um, IPCC started out um, going back into the um, late 80s, uh, essentially when climate change was a science agenda. 
it, it had a marginal policy implication. Um, there were people like James Hansen who'd gone up in front of Congress and, and argued for the policy importance of it, but broadly across the community, it was largely seen as a science agenda. The structures that followed and the processes that followed reflected that. Um, whilst there was a, a policy uh, element which was in the UN Framework Convention, um, there was also a science policy element which was in the what's called SUBSTA, the Subsidiary Body for Technical and Scientific Advice, and then there was the IPCC proper. And most of the attention at that point was on the IPCC, which is the science-driven part of the agenda. Of course, this has now changed. Um, climate change is no longer a science agenda. It's fundamentally a geopolitical, trade, economic agenda, particularly in relation to emission reductions. Still somewhat of a science agenda in terms of the adaptation. And of course, there's that core climate science component as well, which goes with it. But, but the balance in terms of the, the discussion is now much more focused on that sort of economic and geopolitical elements. And, However, the structure of the organisation is essentially the same, so it's split up into three working groups, climate science, adaptation and impacts, um, and mitigation, uh, and the processes are almost exactly the same as they were in the past, even though the population of those processes <coughs> has changed. So, for example, that science policy interface group, the um, Substar, is now essentially a policy body. There's very, very little science that goes into it, so it's actually lost its original intent, which was actually as that science policy interface. So in the products, essentially, um, which started out essentially as what I call a big splash communications product. Um, so every seven years you get three big reports about this thick, or they're now about this thick. Um, uh, they hit the media for a couple of days and then they disappear like everything does in the media cycle. Uh, and they, they don't have a sustained impact. Um, there's also, um, so they, they have very little to do with our current conceptualisation of communication and communication needs. Um, they also lack currency, um, so in a fast moving environment, seven years, uh, there's a lot that happens in that seven years and so they often aren't sufficiently um, current for particular policy discussions. Um, Historically, there's been extremely small opportunity for stakeholder input, um, almost zero, in fact, um, uh, apart from the policymakers themselves, and even that's quite restricted by the nature of the process. Uh, there's almost no integration across the um, working groups. That mainly occurs in what's called the synthesis report, and that itself um, essentially is split upon disciplinary lines rather than being truly integrative of the issues. And it's inherently conservative, and that's partly because of the voting processes in the IPCC. Um, it's a consensus voting process, which applies to the approval of all of the products of the IPC and the branding of those products as IPCC um, branding. And the statements that come out have to be approved. And they have to be approved by every government of the world um, as to be an IPCC <coughs> statement. So that means everyone has to agree, which inherently um, results in conservative statements, which in a sense downplay the risk. Um, so it, it, it pushes it very, very much into the, <clears throat> I guess, the, the middle of the probability distribution rather than the extremes. Um, in the past, there's been essentially no use of modern communications, particularly social media, uh, and so the ability to connect with people has been, has been quite limited. Uh, and there's been very few outreach events, so the ability to go and uh, engage with people to actually understand that contextual needs has been very limited. Um, in my view, that sort of structure and that sort of mode of operation is fundamentally flawed um, in the current environment. We can't afford to continue having the core science policy interface operating in a, a 20th century model. Um, we actually need to change that. So the sorts of things that I've um, sort of been trying to push for quite some years now um, is instead of the big splash operation, is actually starting to, to release um, multiple products. So release them on a regular basis. Um, so, so it's a, what I call a drip feed model of communication instead of the big splash model. So every six months you have something which is new, something which is relevant, something which actually speaks to the policy needs of the day. Um, uh, we also need to um, have those as focused and different. You can't afford just, I think, to have one type of report. You have to have multiple types of reports. You have to have global, globally relevant information. You also have to have regionally relevant information and sectorally relevant information, such as, say, on food security. Um, you also need to have much more integrated communication, so, so have outreach events, um, social media, and the products themselves actually much more accessible to people um, than in the past. And we know how to do this. The um, NCA, under the leadership of Cathy um, and Susie, um, did a lot of that outreach. You established um, fantastic stakeholder networks. 
um, networks of networks, um, which actually had two-way communication. So you brought information in and you put it out in ways that were actually much more meaningful. And really simple things such as uh, in the report, you had every paragraph, every table, every figure having its own URL. So in terms of social media, if someone says this is an important figure, you don't go to a 100-page chapter, you go Im immediately to that figure. Incredibly powerful, incredibly simple way of operating. Um, and so and th those iconic figures are really important to be able to get out to communities um, so that they understand um, those figures. Um, I think we also need, though, you also, as well as having those, um, in a sense, much more targeted and focused and regular reports, you still need to bring together this into some sort of comprehensive and consolidated activity. But I'd argue that that needs to happen on something like a more decadal basis rather than seven years. So you pull together all of those separate sectoral and regional reports, the more focused ones, and you pin them together and actually integrate them so you actually start to have a consolidated view. And as, the, in a sense, the pace of um, uh, science ad, uh, advances have increased, oh, sorry, decreased, um, I think the regularity of those reports needs to change. You don't need to have them at five years or seven year timeframes. A decade is probably enough to reflect the change. So if, you, for example, you look at working group one, the difference between the um, climate scenarios between uh, the um, fourth assessment and the fifth assessment were very marginal. There was very, very little change. There's not a lot of change there that warrants um, those sort of that big investment by the science community. And of course we need to have much more out effective outreach, we need to think about partnership models in terms of communication, um, which has implications for branding, um, and we also need to think about essentially a sustained assessment model. So a lot of the thoughts that went into um, some, um, my suggestions in terms of the sustained assessment in the US actually came from my considerations of what needs to happen in the IPCC. And so um, I think in, because you've actually moved ahead in the sustained assessment here in the US, I think you can actually inject that back into the IPCC process as a way of thinking about how to do that better. Now I think um, in all of these situations there's some things which need to be retained, is that it's not all about change, it's also about what's good about the processes. So I think IPCC needs to um, have that mantra that it's policy informing, not policy prescriptive, and that goes for many people around the table, we're not in the business of, of actually prescribing policy. Um, it needs to have authoritative process, um, so effective review, effective scoping, effective um, writing teams which bring together the e existing knowledge. Um, we need to also have effective branding so that, that you don't get dilution of, of what's actually a really important institution. And it needs to continue to deliver on the credible and legitimate um, elements of the cash and buyers at triumvirate. Um, uh, but it also needs to um, think about much more about the relevance and the sort of structures I, and products that I've been talking about increase that relevance component, um, or at least I hope they would do so. Um, but of course um, it's not uh, without its stresses. Um, funding for IPCC is reduced and so there's a need um, to do more with less and, and that's probably not an uncommon uh, um, thing around the table. Um, it's it's uh, pretty standard. So what I'm just trying to do here, the lessons from, I'd say from IPCC is if you actually have, uh, when you start out with an effective institutional structure, an effective type of science that contributes to that uh, and your system evolves and the questions evolve, you can't afford to have that same structure and that same type of science. As the issues evolve, you actually need to change. You need to change the type of science you bring to the table and you need to change the processes which make those, that science meaningful. Thank you. <laughs>